much. It's great to turn up at a conference and discover you're the opening speaker. Um, <laughs> I was wondering when I was going to be up. So um, I was probably paying enough attention to email or something like that. Um, well, excellent to be here. I've actually been sort of tracking this conference for a few years and going, just never really managed to coordinate to, to be here at the right time. So this year I made an effort to, to do it and uh, got here by... So yesterday morning I left Copenhagen. <laughs> and so I'm sort of still on Central European time, but seems to be surviving. All right, so who am I? Well, this is kind of a summary of what I've been up to in the last few years. That's my Twitter icon. Um, and I've been out there doing talks to people and I can kind of summarize it really as like baffling late adopters as a service. And you know, go around and explain to people and they go, no, we can't do that. Um, and uh, I did this for a few years with Netflix. And so let's just kind of, I'll go through briefly, you know, what was going on here. 2009, Netflix said, we're going to go to cloud. And everyone said, you're just crazy. And in 2010, we actually started doing cloud. And people said, OK, it seems like you really are trying to do this, but it's not going to work. So the beginning of 2010, Netflix put the first pub customer facing pieces of the site up on the cloud on AWS. And by the end of the year, it was all there. Basically, all the customer facing stuff was up there. And for the summary of that summary, it's not going to work. 2011, uh, actually there were some big uh, cloud outages during 2011 where AWS had issues and lots of other sites went down. Netflix didn't go down when, every, when everything else went down. So that, that's kind of a nice feature. And then we was growing like crazy, scaling like crazy, and we seemed to have a pretty fast uh, turnaround for getting software done. So they said, okay, it does work, but it only works for you. And that's when I adopted the uh, Cloudicorn as my Twitter icon. I'm very unicorn, <laughs> right? Um, so the year after that, I said, okay, that looks good. Um, we actually think we would actually like to do some of that too, but uh, we can't figure out how to get there from here. You know, there's, we, we like the, actually we decided we do like the look of this. Um, and it might work for people that are just unicorns, but we can't get there. So what, what, but beginning of 2012, Netflix started aggressively open sourcing lots and lots and lots of bits of software. Um, and that kind of helped that. So, Last year I was going and doing roughly the same kind of talk, you know, the talk changed, but I was roughly going and saying this is, this is kind of what Netflix did. And um, the final thing was, you know, this is, uh, people were using the code, so I was actually having conversations about specific things we were doing, people were saying, well, when are you going to release this new piece? And so the whole conversation had moved on. So, so I'll just try and summarize what, what I learned from this. And, and the real key thing that Netflix optimized for was speed. Right. You can decide to optimize the cost, or flexibility, or whatever, but what Netflix optimized for speed, because Netflix is a very small company with a large number of really big competitors, and you really got to dodge around and, and be very, very disruptive. And you do that by taking friction out of product development, so you have a high trust, low process environment with really no handoffs between teams. You have to organize yourself so that there are the processes don't have this step where you stop and have to get through a gate kind of stuff, right? Um, that's based on this freedom and responsibility culture. You've probably all seen the Netflix culture deck. Uh, I was at Netflix for seven years. I was part of the discussions of whether we should do that deck at all and helped edit it a few times. But, you know, really Reed Hastings uh, wrote most of it and put it out there. And the other thing is to clear other stuff out of the way so that you can concentrate on the things that help you go fast. So removing undifferentiated heavy lifting. Things like using AWS so you don't have to think about building data centers and how many data centers do I need and how many machines do I need in the data center. Oh, I bought the wrong kind of machine and all that stuff. So all of that went away um, through using cloud. And using cloud speeds everything up. I think most people have finally figured out that the cloud at least speeds things up. Um, as an architect, as the overall cloud architect for Netflix, I didn't have architecture review board meetings and make everybody kind of write submissions and do, you know, is, is version A better than, than option B and things like that, which is kind of what I saw happening at, at eBay when I was there a little earlier. Um, what I really did was I documented the emergent behaviors of the team, and so that's a good idea, and made sure more people knew about the good ideas, and when I saw something I thought was a bad idea, I kind of raised that as a bad idea, and kind of create anti-patterns so that people would learn not to do certain things. Um, and, you know, some of the outages helped enforce that. <laughs> so mostly what I was worrying about was the overall availability of the system, because uh, most people were optimizing their individual piece they were building, and so I had kind of that big picture view of how everything hooked together. 
And then the other thing is you can just use cloud to take whatever you used to do in the data center and make it go faster. But all of a sudden, you can do things you would never dream of doing in the data center. And there's quite a few examples from Netflix. So we did things that you just would never, you don't think, it you, you wouldn't be possible to even consider doing them. Like if any of you, have you ever tried to uh, set up systems in Latin America, particularly Brazil. Brazil has these import duties. It's incredibly hard to ship hardware there. Uh, but we went, well, you know, we have customers there. What if we stand up some services there? Can we speed things up? So we, as an experiment, for a few weeks, we set up, you know, we had like 100 machines in Brazil. It didn't really work very well, so we shut it down again. The net cost was, you know, whatever, a few thousand dollars for the machines for a few weeks, right? Don't try that with a real ops team and actual hardware and real data centers. They'll get very pissed off at you if you say, let's launch, you know, let's, let's hire an entire team in Brazil. Oh, we didn't really need them, right? So the, the, that kind of thing. So this is what's going on in enterprise right now. This is the enterprise cloud adoption curve from Simon Wardley. Um, so they ignore it, and then the rest of the world starts doing it, and they say no, and then they say, I said no, get it, and then the rest of the world really adopting it, and they say, oh no, and then they say, oh shit, uh, and then they actually catch up and start doing it. So this, is, this applies to mobile and all the other things that the enterprises adopt, yeah, probably Linux and whatever. Um, Netflix was a bit ahead of the rest of the world, so I think sort of 2009, Netflix went all the way to cloud pretty rapidly. And um, you know, I was kind of that was what I was doing. What I'm doing now, I have this new role where um, at this collision where enterprise IT is sort of having that sort of two garbage collapse colliding in slow motion sort of thing with uh, with with cloud, right? There's sort of the explosion and there's people running around and no one's really sure what's happening. But but enterprise IT is trying to figure out how to do cloud right now. And um, it's an interesting time to have left Netflix and now be working at a VC firm and um, looking at all the startups and all of the new patterns and trying to help explain to the big enterprise companies what they should be doing and then talking to the startups about how they should fit into that story. So the timing I think was good. One of the reasons I left Netflix was you know, a bunch of friends of mine in the VC world said this is absolutely the right time to do this because this is actually the year that enterprises finally went from having that cloud thing be a thing they were poking at with a long stick and they weren't sure about so now being, it's, it's mainstream. It doesn't mean they've finished their move to cloud, but if you look at most large enterprises and say, who are your strategic vendors? You know, you've got you know, IBM and HP and VMware, and now they have AWS up there, Microsoft. Right? So most large enterprises have Microsoft and AWS as primary vendors, strategic vendors, and they're figuring out how to use those two clouds. Uh, almost no enterprises have Google Cloud as a strategic vendor, and that's, you know, that's, that's kind of the thing Google's trying to, trying to figure out how to get through. So when you have big enterprises uh, adopting stuff, some of them get ahead of the others, and some of them, what, what they're trying to do is disrupt each other. So let's look a bit at what separates the incumbents, the people that are going to be disrupted, from the people that are going to do the disrupting. And it really comes down to this, this nice old statement, which I, lots of people seem to claim that, you know, it isn't what you know, don't know that gives you trouble, it's what you know that ain't so, right? So, that, so people get disrupted because they figured something out and it seems to work for them, then they sit on it and the world changes underneath them and somebody else comes along and realizes that what they're, they're based on is not true. So they, uh, the companies make assumptions and you've got a billion dollars of revenue based on a bunch of assumptions, so that's cool. You optimize your business for getting more of these billions of dollars of revenue um, but then you know, somebody else comes up with another way of doing it that maybe doesn't have billions of dollars of revenue but has all of the developers start using it. And you get this effect where the, the measuring a market by dollars of revenue is a backwards looking metric. Measuring it by developer adoption is a forward looking metric. Um, you know, the best example right now is probably Docker. How many dollars are there in Docker? Near enough zero. You know, how many dollars are there in you know, VMware and things like that? It's a lot, right? But you know, where is the developer enthusiasm right now? It's, it's all around Docker. So I'm gonna look at one assumption, which is that process prevents problems. That sort of a lot of people, they have companies and things go wrong, and every time something goes wrong, you create a thing, not do that again, right? Like, look at the laws, right? All the laws that Congress puts in, or your local council, or whatever, it's, it's basically scar tissue. <laughs> every time something broke, every time somebody got hurt, there was something bad happened. We need a law to prevent that. So you put a law in, 
and you end up with this thing sort of everything slows down. And, you know, part of the problem, I think, one of the interesting problems America has is it's a relatively young country, and it doesn't really know how to deal with this scarce issue of having too many laws and too complex. So much older civilizations have sort of figured out a, a way to sort of manage that, but it, that's kind of a meta-level discussion for a few years later. Um, there's a sort of, yeah, so the US is sort of getting choked by, by this sort of layers of laws and, and, and sort of outrage that things aren't right and you should fix it. But what you actually see is that, you know, HR manuals are just like stuff that you don't ever do that again. Um, and product development processes uh, tend to end up building up in this way. So this is one of the reasons big companies end up being slow is that they, they're trying to never do anything wrong again. So if you're in one of these big, slow companies and trying to speed it up, there's, there's you know, a kind of, a lot of this is when I'm sounding like a, uh, sort of an alien from outer space, you know, and that little, that first tweet really comes in, you know, baffling late adopters. So this, this one, one of the first steps is, is to get this book, The Phoenix Project. Most people know this book? A few, few of you? Um, this is the book to give to everyone else in management and make them read it. It's a novel, it's really a horror story. Uh, about everything that ever went wrong in IT that, that's going to put a company out of business. And the first half of the book is basically a company going to the brink of going out of business. First few pages um, opens with a, a manager, an IT manager, gets a phone call on the way to work. Uh, you're the director of IT and the VP and the CIO and the VP and the CIO just quit. Uh, okay. Um, go, you have a meeting with the CEO when you get to work. That's not a good sign. Uh, <laughs> by the way, Wi-Fi is down for the whole company, and we've got a corrupted uh, payroll, and it's payday, right? And it's a manufacturing company. And so it's okay. So the book starts there and goes downhill a long way. <laughs> At one point, the, uh, the the security guy sort of disappears, and they find him sort of drunk in a bar somewhere, lying in a ditch or something. Uh, um, and so here's a complete nervous breakdown. So the whole, you know, it's, everything goes wrong, but due to the miracle of DevOps and Kanban and to fluffy DevOpsy sort of stuff, the world gradually gets better. It was written by Gene Kim, and Gene's back, George's back, the details there. So it's got, it's a, and it's a really a homage to a book that most people ever went on an MBA or management read to you know 30 years ago called Goal by by, by um, Goldratt. I knew Goldratt, right? So a lot of people may have remembered this book called this. If, if you're trying to sell this to management, say there was this book called The Goal. Do you remember that from when you did your MBA? Oh yeah, vaguely it's had constraint theory of constraints and how to optimize. Okay, this is the same plot. It's a homage to it, but brought into the modern world about how. Software is now critical to every company, and you can't just say that's something we just put off on the side and it's not cool. So it's just, it's really about the software eating the world kind of effect. All right, so enough of a rant on that. So let's look at the product development processes, and I don't have time to go through this. I usually have a whole lot of slides that go through waterfall and gradually speeding things up and showing how to end up with continuous delivery. So I'll just go straight to the end here, which is if you're trying to do continuous delivery and, and, and you're at the bleeding edge of software development, then this is kind of what your process looks like. You're doing something that looks a bit like a Google loop, observe or any decide act. I don't really care what the labels are, but you have to do something like this. First thing is, um, you've got to measure some customers. You've got to be able to measure your customers somehow. And then you can see there's a land grab opportunity. Netflix right now is land, literally land grabbing the world. They launched it in Germany, France, and a bunch of other European countries about two weeks ago. Uh, that is land grab, right? You see a competitor make a move, and you decide to go, you know, respond to that move. Or you see a customer pain point, and you go, you know, how many more customers really have that pain point? So this is what most companies call their innovation process. Like, what? how do you get ideas about what you should be doing, right? So the next thing is, you're going to analyze those ideas, maybe figure out how many customers have that pain point, model some hypotheses about what you could do about that, and that's really what, that's kind of big data. That's what, what people use big data for nowadays. And the thing, the way I like to think about big data is I want to be able to answer questions that have never been asked before. If you're asking the same question every week, that's for business intelligence, and you write those reports, and you get, you know, you sold this much stuff last week. This is. I have to do a rummage around in a bunch of log files that have never been looked at. I have to clean up data. I have to go run, you know, it's all this unstructured data. But you can then, you then have a hypothesis that if you did something, that customer pain point might go away. And then you look at the culture. 
Um, you're going to plan some responses, you're going to just I think, do it, and then you're going to share the plans, right? So this is a culture that just lets you get on and do things, rather than have to go and you know, escalate through management for permission to do anything at all. So really going fast, you have to have a culture that supports it. And then you're going to look, you know, you're going to be do, do everything as incremental features because we're trying to get really fast around this loop. Um, you can automatically deploy those features. You can use A-B tests to deploy, so you can safely deploy things, try them out, see if it's better than the way the world was before. Did the customers actually get happy or not? Um, measure the customers again, and go around this loop. You don't just go around the loop. And if you look at sort of Boyd's original OODA loop, there's a bunch of other things. So you actually go back from orient to observe, and there's some decide to orient, and there's, you know, you're going back and forth in different directions. Right? But the, the fundamental thing is, the real measure of agility in a modern company is how fast you can get around this loop. And if you have a culture where everything has to be approved in triplicate, you'll block at that point. And if you don't have the ability to fit, get your, your structured data and throw it into a massive Hadoop cluster and crunch through it in, in an hour or so, you can't get through this quickly. And a lot of companies have trouble just getting innovation done because they, nobody feels able to stand up and say this thing looks broken. Right. And cloud really is just speeding up that piece over there. So, I, I've been, this, this is, this, there's quite a lot of um, big companies that are organized into silos, and the silos look something like this, right? You've got product management silo, and then there's user experience design silo, and there's developers, and there's QA, and DBAs, and sysadmins, and admins, and sign admins, right? And to get something deployed, you have to chain through all of these silos, and there are handoffs, and you're writing tickets, and you're scheduling all these different teams and you're trying to get something done. So, you know, if you're trying to build something like a monolithic delivery, um, you have to go across all these teams. So if you want to build a faster way of doing it and you want to reorganize, you have to take people from all these teams and build a product team that can go end to end with no handoffs. And you end up building one of those for each thing you're trying to deliver. Um, but there's, there's another way of doing it, which is basically if to do microservices. And the, um, you split things up. So you have a platform team, which is kind of what used to be operations. And so this platform team may not even work for you, because if you, you know, the way Netflix works, most of the platform team work up in Seattle for AWS, right? So there's an API, yeah, there's an API between the operations -y kind of stuff and the developer -y kind of stuff. And now you can go around this and you can independently deploy lots of things. And, you know, Getting these things organized, quite often the, the, um, the people working over here, it's, it's really from a different pace and, and you're, you're aggregating at a different point. So this is a reasonably efficient way of organizing. But for most companies, this is a reorg. So this isn't just forming teams this way, so you should organize the company this way. So think, so think of DevOps, so when com as big companies move to DevOps, it isn't like adding a DevOps team that doesn't really solve the problem, because it's just adding another one of these silos. What you really want to be doing is reorganizing your company so that the company is organized in teams this way, and management and everything is now managing across products, where the product teams are like little startups that individually build their microservices. <coughs> and the way Netflix works, there's maybe you know, 50 or 100 teams, well, no, maybe not 50, but anyway, it's like 50 different teams all building microservices independently. Um, and the way sort of Etsy or something works, they have a more monolithic approach where everybody in the company gets very, really good at rolling out this, this system in a very agile way. So there's, there's not, there are different ways of doing it. If you've got a fairly small team, you have a release plan, you're going around this loop, you've got a bunch of developers to do something, you, you give it over QA, and then you, you know, ops replaces the op with the new, and everyone's using the same system, because it's a monolith, so everything has to be on PHP or whatever. The problem with that is that if you find a bug, you have to go back and you know, one developer can block the release for all the other developers. And that's okay if there's only a handful of people. Um, and then if you have a bad operations deployment, you have to go back again and you're blocking it again. So you have all these people working on features which work, but they can't de be delivered to customers because they're blocked because it's being done one and the other So this works. It's the way most startups work. It's, it's the sort of small team. This is the optimal way of doing it. But as the team gets bigger, you really need to split things up. And, and this is kind of one of the transitions Netflix went through about four years ago, which was building a monolithic app to the microservices approach. So you've got lots of individual release plans, 
and each of them have their own development teams, and they're all written in different languages, and no one really cares. But you wrap them all up in something like a, a container, so like you know, Docker or, or an AMI or something like that, and then your system knows how to deploy those to production. So that's, and they're all deploying independently, and there's no blocking going on. Now, if one of these has a bug, you just redeploy that one, right? The rest of them are already out there, right? So, so as these teams get bigger and bigger, and you have hundreds of developers, you, you end up having to do something like this, otherwise everything slows down and you end up with product cycles that take longer and longer and longer because you're trying to integrate more and more stuff together. So the neat thing here is the old release is still running um, and you didn't actually break it. Even if I deployed a new thing that's completely broken, the old code's still there. So this is, this is a pattern that's sometimes called the immutable, the immutable code pattern. Um, and the idea is that you can always deploy something to production because you, as long, if you don't take away the old version. And then you just have to wrap traffic very carefully so that most people don't see the new one. And because it might be broken, you don't really know at this point. So you go and play around and you basically do testing in production. Um, so effectively, A-B tests, feature flags, and this sort of version routing. It's a, it's a new way of thinking about it for most people. And you need a platform that knows how to do this. But that's what basically helps you roll things out very safely. So what's going on here is that you're, at, over time, as we're speeding things up, we're reducing the cost and the size and the risk of change, and we're using that to speed up the rate of change. So this, this is a disruptor, and companies that are figuring out how to do this are able to be much more agile, get a lot more done, they learn from their customers, and they get around that loop really quickly. So, you know, but, and then other companies going, oh crap, we have to go do this too. And that's really one of the reasons that's driving, you're know, hearing a lot of talk right now in enterprise about you know, how do we do DevOps, what is this microservices thing, all of that kind of stuff. So let's just go uh, try and come up with a definition for microservices here. So that's my definition, loosely coupled services oriented architecture with bounded context. So what do I mean by loosely coupled? Well, if you have to update every microservice at the same time in lockstep because everything's sort of you know, it doesn't work if, unless you do that, that's not loosely coupled. You want to be able to update everything independently. And the other thing, with bounded context, you don't want to know too much about everything else around you. You can be very, very effective and productive if you don't need to know too much. So I just, I need to know how to build this thing, and there's APIs to everything else. I don't really know how to know in great detail how everything else works. I just have to know how to talk to it with its APIs. Um, and, you know, bounded context, I, I, the, the slide has been here in my deck for a while. Eric's actually sitting in the front row here, and Steve is wrong. Uh, this conference was actually um, put in this location because, so that Eric could walk here. <laughs> <laughs> he, lives, he, lives 50, he lives like three blocks away, and yeah, 15 yeah. minutes walking here. So at least one person now can just walk to this event. Anyway, the main driven design, um, there's a whole bunch of good content, good, good ideas in that book, and, and, and Eric's given a lot of presentations on that. But the idea is that, um, think of it as you, you know, the, the best example here is probably building a mobile app. You have you know, lots and lots of APIs. You have an API to talk to Facebook and Twitter and Foursquare and you know, a bunch of other monitoring tools and things like that. And you don't have to go and have a negotiation with the Google Maps team about exactly what they're doing to just use their API. So the way you need to do it is break your company up so that your company has APIs back and forth. So what we're trying to do here is, is sort of invert Conway's law and build an organization that where, which turns into the microservices you want. So if you lay out your teams and let every team deploy independently, they will end up building microservices anyway. But even if you don't have to tell them to build microservices, you just organize it in this way and everyone builds a set of services that they control and deploy. Um, you want, kind of want to keep everything somewhat single function. It's sort of roughly a developer per microservice to start with, but you know, after a while the services get bigger and bigger and might split them up a bit. Um, you want some kind of container. Netflix started doing this about four or five years ago when, and, and decided to use the, the, the AMI as the container. So they build everything that's going to be in the service into an AMI, and then they use Amazon to deploy that. That takes a few minutes to build, a few minutes to deploy. Now this year, hey, we have Docker. It's now a few seconds to build, a few seconds to deploy, but it's conceptually the same thing. It's just a much more efficient way of doing it. And the other thing is that everything in production, you want to have them be cattle, not pets. And as you have run into that analogy, um, 
Yeah, I've been away from home for about a month now, and, and uh, there's a cat at home, and I kind of want to know my cat's still alive, right, and has a name. So if you have machines in production that you, have, that you know their name, and when they go down, everyone in your company gets unhappy, that's a pet, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a really bad idea because, you know, things die and things break. But if what you have is, you know, a herd of cattle, and what you really care about is how many gallons of milk you're getting, so it's a dairy herd, you know, you could have beef herds, but the dairy herds are a bit easier to think about in the morning. Um, <laughs> so you get some milk, and then a couple of cows die overnight. You still get most of the milk left the next day, right? You just have fire up a few more cows, and you get your milk back to where it's going, right? But the, yeah, but the cows have numbers, right? It's not, it's not Daisy, Buttercup, and whatever, right? They don't, they're not pets, right? Any individual cow dying doesn't hurt, right? But what, as long as you've got a field of them, and they're, they're replaceable entities, and you've got enough of them, and you sort of scale up and down based on how much milk you need. So, so think of that as it's a really good analogy for one of the big architectural rules that Netflix ended up with was to have everything running in production was an autoscaler. Every, everything was an autoscaler group. Even if you only wanted one of them, it had to be disposable. You could kill it, and it would just restart it itself. But in general, there would be at least three of anything, and typically now like 600 for the big services. And then you can scale them down at night. So there's maybe 100 API servers at 3 a.m., and there's probably 700 of them on a Sunday night at 7 p.m. So that's peak traffic for Netflix, by the way, which is really annoying because the developers will want to be at home watching Netflix with their kids, <laughs> <laughs> which is why it's the peak. Um, OK. And that actually even applies to the stateful layer, so I don't have a time to go into it. But Netflix uses Cassandra, a globally distributed system, and using ephemeral instances with local disk on top of on, on them, and you can kill those, the disk goes away and it just gets replaced and everything gets, gets carried on. So it's possible to do that every there. Um, so I've been talking about Netflix. There's there's over 40 projects on Netflix open source. I did a two-hour workshop on this last uh, last week in, in when I was in in um, Denmark and you know tried to just get through them all in two hours and it was really difficult. Uh, lots of lots of good code here and there are quite a few people using this code to go out and build large-scale systems. So. so what we're trying to do here is separate concerns in the right way. Rather than saying I'm going to separate the concerns of the sysadmin from the storage admin from the QA engineer, I'm going to separate the concerns of building this piece of this piece of product, this feature, this microservice, from this other microservice. Because some of them are fairly mature and they're changing slowly. Some of them are changing very rapidly. You want to be able to separate that way. And then bounded context so that you can be very productive. You can hire somebody, put them on a team, and they can very quickly build something because they don't have to understand how it, the entire system works in order to be productive working on a piece of it. So there's a couple of questions that always come up. Um, and one of them you know, from, is, well, yeah, it sounds great, but I'm a big old enterprise and we're all set up this way, and where do we start, right? Where's, where, where can you start to do this? And I think one of the places to start is mobile. If you look at most enterprises, they have a mobile team that's building apps for the enterprise, and it's usually stuck off on the side because it's weird and doesn't look like any of the other operations stuff. That's what everything needs to look like, right? Because they have APIs for talking to the rest of the organization, um, it's a horizontally integrated team of like the mobile product guy and the mobile uh, developers, and then their deployment consists of poking it in an app store, which is sort of API driven, and somebody else makes it sort of turn up on the phones, right? Which is exactly the model we're talking about here. You can think of the app store as sort of a, it's another variant of just deploying to cloud through a platform. So I think that the, in most companies, the mobile team is already sort of the right DevOps model to go follow. So, and, and so look at the way that's organized and just copy that. Start making the people that are providing APIs to that team and the other, other, other teams sort of look a bit more like that. Another pushback I've had, and I was doing a Gartner Research Board um, talk a year or so ago, uh, and so sort of some Fortune 100 CTOs, and they said, yeah, it's all very well for you. You have this superstar team, and you know, we don't have those kind of engineers. Where do you, where do you, you, know, where do you get those engineers from? Uh, and, and I was like, one of the best, uh, every now and again your brain works and you get the right answer you know, in a flash. So this is the answer. We got them from you. <laughs> I was like, okay, we hired this guy from Young Foods, this guy from Pump, those two guys from Comcast, this guy from Apple, 
and you were getting in the way of all these people that you still have all the, you have plenty of talent, but most companies are wasting it, getting in the way, and just not letting it flourish. And there are people with, I, I was having a conversation with a guy who'd been hired into Netflix about a year before, and he said it's like, they said, oh, you're looking, you know, go do this. And they're like, oh, yeah. hey, you look like you're growing some little wings. Grow bigger wings, fly harder. Right? And we just flew this guy off, and he's now like a really senior guy. He's, uh, ben Christensen is, is the guy I'm talking about. He's doing the reactive stuff. He's been presenting all over the world. And it was one of those things where you just, you know, this is incredibly talented guy. When he was at Apple, he was sitting in the queue being told to just work on this thing and not go to conferences and not talk about stuff. So there's an incredible talent in organizations, but you have to learn to get out of its way. And that's a whole different conversation. All right, just one last thing. Um, just in my new role in, in VC world, there's a few things that I think are interesting. Uh, one of them in particular is, is the Go language. Just, I'd say three quarters of everything that comes through that's new is written in Go right now. It's just, you know, Docker's written in Go. It's just, you know, Vivid Cortex, AppSero, they're rewriting Cloud Foundry in Go. This is, a lot of these infrastructure enterprise IT things are being rewritten in Go. And, you know, I'm just throwing that out there as a thought. If you see something that needs writing, Probably this is, this is a good place to go to sort of start building because they're getting a lot of traction. The other one is that this book, which Joe Sumble is, keeps, keeps like sitting in the audience and cringing when I, when I present. But um, the, uh, this is what enterprises are doing. They're trying to adopt continuous delivery DevOps and lean startup at scale. And this is a book about that, which is not quite finished, but Jez promises he's still working on it and it's gonna be out really soon. But you can get the, uh, like the digital version of it that will keep changing. You can get that, just the paper version is not out yet. And finally, it, it, the whole discussion when you look at people talking about Docker, they keep talking about microservices, that word keeps coming up. It's becoming kind of a new buzzword. So figure out what that looks like. Um, even Workday, you know, it says HR software, ERP software. There was, a, there was an interview with them uh, a week or so ago where they said, yeah, blah, 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 all this business stuff. And they said, yeah, we're moving to microservices. And we're trying to copy all the Netflix model and we have Chaos Monkeys running against it. And this is ERP and HR software. Um, so that's staying, that's really cool. The, the ideas have got that deeply stuck in. Um, okay, but questions or whatever. Um, I just finished in half an hour. Um, there's a whole bunch of videos where I've gone into a lot more detail on these things. Monitorama, lots of interesting comments about uh, monitoring the tools. Um, anyway. And I'm doing some more talks that are still on here. Reinvent is going to be a completely new talk about totally new subjects, which I'm here to write now. Because <laughs> <laughs> they started whining at me about one thing or another. What happens? Yeah? Good question. So you talked about reorganizing development teams to try and make smaller teams that are more compact and self contained. Uh, working on a large enterprise that has other concerns, this is something maybe a little different from the Netflix model. How do you pull in all this? ancillary people like legal and privacy that end up getting mired and becoming these gateways that you have to get through to get into production. How do you pull those in and help them become more uh, participatory in the process? There, there are platform teams. I mean, everybody has some broad platform teams that, that everything else depends upon, right? So um, that's one, one approach is just to build that. Generally, you want to make everything as self-service and API driven as, poss as possible. And so lawyer is a service. Yeah, so it's actually, a service. It's a service. <laughs> so, so for one example, um, so Netflix, before they, actually years ago, Netflix's lawyers got together with the Apache Foundation lawyers and set up a contract that says, okay, we understand what the Apache um, license means, and this is what we're going to do, and, this is, and, and then they went to the rest of engineering and said, okay, uh, if you want to do anything with open source, you can use any Apache license software, you can contribute bug fixes, you can create new projects. If you see a different license on something, go talk to one of the lawyers and we'll treat that as a special case. Now, not the lawyers are particularly slow, but you know, it makes it really easy to deal with that. Um, so you can kind of pre-set up a bunch of things like that. There's, there's, the other thing is don't take the thing which applies to a small part of your business and apply it to everything, right? So if you think about Netflix, it's, you know, maybe it's like 500 developers or something working on the cloud stuff. 
there's probably 400 of them who work on, on an environment that's maybe 20,000 machines deployed and everyone has root everywhere and there's no SOX compliance of, and there's no PCI compliance in that environment, right? Then there's an environment up on the site, totally separate AWS account that has maybe you know, 50 developers and a couple of hundred machines that does all the SOX compliance stuff and it has audit logs and things like that. And then there's an even smaller team that has background checks that have the credit cards and there's a credit card vault. And they're in the process of moving their credit card vault to AWS running on Cassandra. That's, that's, they're, I'm not quite sure where they are, but that will be done this summer, I think. May already be done. Um, but so that, that was the current step. But that is a small team very locked down, yet, yet another different account, but it's like tens of machines. So don't have the rules you need for those tens of machines apply to the 20,000 machines which do everything else, right? And then the other thing is just, you know, being really good about encrypting first man and cloud information when it's out in the, in the large system. So you, there's a bunch of protections you can put in there to get the lawyers to concentrate on the little piece of the system and have that be um, iterating in the time effects. More time for questions? So. Yeah, we take a couple more. Any more? Yeah. Uh, the emergence of uh, past platforms, can you see that impacting what you've been doing in the past and how that sort of work going forward? Uh, I think the Lenovo process is, is a past platform, platform, but it's one which is relatively hard to consume because it's only really makes sense of scale. So most of the people that have used it are people who have really big problems. And it's a, uh, you can have a path that's a very narrow straight track that ties everything down, like Heroku or something like that. But it's it very constrained at the early Google App Engine and that by everything like the right. So as a platform gets broader and broader and has, has a wider selection of options, it gets harder to figure out, basically. And it gets a bit more complicated. So, um, so there's a range of paths, right? There's, there's everything from the sort of her the, the older style Heroku stuff um, to Cloud Foundry, which is pretty common now. Um, a lot of enterprises playing with it. And then we have the news of AppSero, who now have you know, uh, Ericsson trying to push them out to all of the, the um, telco space. That's got a lot of policy automation. I think that's interesting because it's very hard to add policy and security to a thing. It, but if you build it in the foundation, you can, you can build a system on top. So that's their pitch, right? It's like, we built the foundation better. We'll see if that works out for them. Um, so there's, there are lots of platforms, and you end up building your own platform, right? So you either take something off the shelf or you end up building it. You know, Twitter's built their own platform, and there's a bunch of good tooling there. Um, depending on what language set you want to use, there are different platforms that are friendlier or, or less, mm -hmm. and depending on how you want to automate it. So a bunch of different options there, but I think we'll see. The, the interesting thing that happened in the last six months or so is everyone's decided that Docker is the container for the platform. So then Cloud Foundry is doing Docker, and everyone, you know, OpenShift is Docker, uh, AppServe is Docker, Mesos is Docker. E everything is now based on Docker. So if you just develop stuff with Docker, someone probably got to figure out a platform that will deliver that Docker container to production somehow. Right? So now abstracted away the need to really worry about what the PaaS is to some extent. Right? Cool. Thank you. Good. Thanks. Thanks.